But we have a major problem. I don't think foreign direct investment is getting us out of anything. Okay. I think domestic investment is the is the future. You know, the auto industry was developed in South Africa to solve the poor white problem. And of course, most poor whites ended up in Eastern Cape. From a specialized machine builder to a global tech company, Gendermark Automation continues to drive forward thinking tech solutions. And now we're talking the fourth industrial revolution. Join us on our journey as we talk to industry experts and discover the incredible people behind the technology. We're making the fourth industrial revolution more human. He is the inaugural executive director of the Toyota Vessels Institute for Manufacturing Studies. He was associate professor of the University of KwaZulu Natal. He is the chairman of BNM Analysts and has been involved in government as an advisor to formulate both the clothing and textile industry policies as well as the automotive industry policy for South Africa for the past decade. He is passionate about manufacturing from lean implementation, technology foresight analysis, executive management skills development, national industrial policy development, global value chain analysis, local cluster development, and firm level competitiveness challenges. Please help me welcome Dr. Justin Barnes. Uh, well, Justin, thank you very much for sitting down with us. Um, before we actually get into the podcast, Yanish, would you mind telling us what is the standard we have be behind us and just describe it a bit to us? Cool. Uh, Justin, firstly, thanks for, for joining us. Goodwill. Welcome back. <laughs> so the, the, the stand behind us is um, our inaugural 4IR learning uh, factory that we're developing for the CSR. Uh, and the idea, the idea behind it is to showcase um, uh, all the various technologies uh, that constitute the fourth industrial revolution in one stand. So that's the, the idea behind the stand behind us. So, so Justin, uh, can you please tell us about uh, TWIMS sure. and, and the role that it's playing <laughs> Um, in, in leadership and, and in the space of industrialization. Okay, so the Toyota Vessels Institute for Manufacturing Studies, as the name would suggest, uh, actually originates from a discussion at, uh, at Toyota back in 2014, where the Toyota senior leadership was essentially exploring the opportunity to contribute towards the development of management skills in South Africa. And obviously, quite selfishly, I wanted to focus on the development of manufacturing management skills. And uh, they called me in and uh, asked me to work with the team at, uh, at Toyota to conceptualize and develop the, um, the model that would sort of realize that uh, objective. And so we looked at different options and we came to the conclusion um, through the um, inaugural chair of, of TWIMS, Dr. Jan van Zell, that what we needed to do was to establish a business school with a manufacturing management orientation. And so in 2018, we um, found premises and uh, we uh, moved into this beautiful 1899 build uh, out in Kloof and Kwazulu Natal. And uh, from then on, we've been developing the campus. Um, we've uh, built some very nice facilities on the campus. We've developed a, an MBA wow. through the Gordon Institute of Business Science. We run the Gibbs MBA on our campus, but it's a manufacturing focused MBA. We have a PhD program as well. Uh, we also have a postgraduate diploma, so postgraduate. And then we developed a host of uh, short courses. Uh, very exciting being done uh, at Gendermark because one of the things that we're looking at doing is establishing a what we call a management sandbox, uh, which uh, looks at these new technologies because obviously industry 4.0, digital physical connectivity is going to shape how manufacturing unfolds over the course of the next few years. And rather than just talking about it academically and exploring the amazing uh, set of sort of YouTube clips that exist in all of these technologies, and uh, just looking at what our community in the manufacturing sector are actually doing in this space, we also want to um, provide our students and our executive delegates on our various courses the opportunity to explore the future of these technologies and play with more cutting edge uh, technology demonstrators that will challenge how they've organized their businesses and how they strategize for the development of their businesses. <coughs> It's really important to emphasize what TWIMS is trying to do. 
South Africa is in a poor economic state for a variety of reasons. One of the primary reasons is the decline in our manufacturing sector. If South Africa had the same contribution of manufacturing to GDP now as it did in 1990, we would employ one and a half million more people. Wow. That's how severe our manufacturing sector has declined. Wow. It's declined from over 22% of our GDP to less than 13% of our GDP. And that's cost us literally one and a half million jobs if we held the, um, the contribution constant over that particular period. And we have to rebuild manufacturing. And, and can you tell us why it, it doesn't contribute into the GDP of the, of the country? Our manufacturing sector has declined for, for several reasons. Um, we entered the global operating environment uh, in the mid-1990s. After democracy, we joined the World Trade Organization and we liberalized our economy. It's arguable as to whether we liberalized it appropriately. I would argue we liberalized it too rapidly, which meant that international came in, uh, competition came in, and uh, we reverted to importing models as opposed to making the products ourselves. Now, if we didn't have an employment crisis, if we didn't have a value creation crisis, that wouldn't be such a big deal. <laughs> but when the economy needs to create wealth, when we need to increase uh, per capita incomes, when we need to drive productivity, we need to stimulate the productive side of the economy. And with the benefit of hindsight, you know, and we're all very smart looking backwards, not always so smart looking forwards. Looking backwards, I think we made some really bad decisions in relation to how we opened up our economy. We opened up too quickly and we caused too much damage to our industrial capabilities in the process. Wow. That's um, uh, quite scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe if I could focus in a little bit on to, I guess, one of the success stories, in, in my opinion, the automotive industry. And I think there have been a number of policy initiatives from the government over the last 15, maybe 20 years. Yeah. Maybe I know that you're an expert in this, uh, in this field. Maybe talk us through the, the sort of history, the 15 year history of the various policies, what worked, what yeah. didn't work and, and introduce us to this automotive master plan that we're now adopting. Okay, so the South African automotive industry developed um, and it's actually great to be in PE because in, uh, I mean, Utenag is the heart of the South African auto industry in terms of its initial development, 1924, 1926, the GM and Ford plants. BW are celebrated 70 years. Yeah. The other day. So wow. you've got this sort of long history of, of production in this area for very interesting historical reasons, by the way. You know, the auto industry was developed in South Africa to solve the poor white problem. And of course, mm -hmm. most poor whites ended up in the Eastern Cape. Um, and which is why the automotive industry concentrated in the Eastern Cape in the 1920s. The wow, I never knew PAC that. Government of, yeah, the PAC government of that period uh, was trying to deal with the, the farms were commercializing. The, the poor whites were being moved off the commercial farms uh, as the farms were consolidating and industrializing. And they couldn't find jobs. Um, wow. The country was running up a, a major balance of payments problem with uh, the automotive industry. And uh, one way to correct that, of course, is to encourage import substitution. And so from the 1920s, we see the development of the automotive industry and it progressively becomes more sophisticated, the nature of the government support for the industry. And in 1958, there's something called the Fulian Commission. The Fulian Commission uh, determines that what the country requires is a more formalized local content program. The auto industry, we've got the gold boom after the Second World War and um, the biggest uh, sort of imported product is vehicles still, or components with very low levels of local content in our vehicles that we were assembling here. Yeah? So this is in the 50s? This eh? is 58, the Fulian Commission. So they, they uh, decide that from 1961, we are going to have a local content program for the South African auto industry. And that evolves in various phases. <clears throat> and of course, as South Africa becomes more isolated uh, globally, those local content provisions become more stringent. And of course, the automotive industry has got a very strong linkage to the military complex. And of course, if you're isolated and you're fighting border wars, what you want to protect is your automotive industry because you need to protect your uh, underlying technology and military vehicles, wow, yeah. which is why South Africa uh, ends up with very uh, high levels of local content requirements in South African vehicles. It's why, remember, uh, Yanesh, you may remember the... the uh, all trucks and buses had yeah. to have an Estas gearbox. Yeah. All engines had to be made by Atlantis uh, diesel engines mm. uh, because those are the transmissions and the engines that went into our tanks and into our rattles and our military vehicles. So you've got this high level of protection up until 1989. And then 
1989, there's a recognition that the automotive industry needs to um, advance its competitiveness. It's falling well behind. We're making lots of old products. So our models tend to last 15, 20 years, whereas globally they last sort of eight, 10 years. And we have phase six of the local content program. It's the last phase of the local content program. And in 1995, um, we launched the Motor Industry Development Program, which actually occurred before democracy. From 1991-92, the union and the ANC, working with the apartheid government, start creating a team of experts to review whether the auto policy is going to be appropriate when, when, when democracy occurs. So you've got the academics... Uh, and the and uh, the um, and the union movement framing the the policy, and they determine that what the auto industry needs is it needs to operate at global scale. And the only way it can global it can operate at global scale is if we create a complementation scheme. So what we do is instead of making lots of models in South Africa at low volume, you make one model or two models at scale. You supply a, a certain volume into the South African market, and the balance you export. When you export, you earn duty credits. And you can then import vehicles into the domestic market. And that's the MRDP launched in September 1995. Now, at that particular point, our tariffs on vehicles were 115%. Wow. Any imported vehicle, 115%. Any imported vehicle. So if you, pay, you, know, you paid 100,000 for it. By the time you, you, you got it, you paid an extra 115%. Uh, on top of that, you paid your 215,000 rand. On the 1st of September, they dropped it to 65%. And then the, every year, they kept dropping it by, by 3%. And by 2000 uh, and about eight, we dropped it to 25%. So we had the sliding scale of opening up the market to, to global competition. But we also created this sort of major incentive through the, um, the export support that was provided under the MIDP. Uh, my first experience of working in, in policy was in 2001. I was asked to come in and review the motor industry development program. You're not going to like hearing this. Uh, my first job as policy was to advise the minister then, Alec Irwin, to um, reduce the benefits that the catalytic converter industry was receiving. <laughs> no, no. Uh, and the reason for that was because the vehicle assemblers had all set up major com uh, catalytic converter export programs where essentially they'd worked out that if you export platinum group metals in a catalytic converter form, you don't have to have any local content in your vehicles because you can earn all the credits yep. you need on exporting through your CAT program. Yep. And so we came up with a program to reduce that to ultimately 40% of the materials qualifying for the export support. Unfortunately, the MIDP worked really well, actually. But unfortunately, we started being challenged. Um, the Australians threatened to take us to the World Trade Organization. Our policy was in breach of something called the Agreement on Subsidies and Countervailing Measures, which is the core trade agreement under the World Trade, o trade Organization. And I remember we had to fly to Canberra. Um, uh, and uh, working as a consultant for the government, we had to go and defend the MIDP with the Australians, and we agreed to remove the program. And we agreed to make it WTO compliant. And so we uh, brainstormed sets of opportunities. We looked at what our global competitors were doing, and we decided that we would adjust the MIDP to the APDP. Um, and what we would do is we would convert the policy from being an export-oriented subsidy towards a production-oriented subsidy. Because mm -hmm. the WTO said you can subsidize industry. It's your sovereign government's wealth, it can determine how it subsidizes industry. It just can't do it through an import. Um, uh, you, can, you can protect um, uh, the local market through import subsidies, but you can't ban imports. Okay. So, sorry to disturb yeah. you, um, Justin. So, so you, you are giving us a background on, on the, the policies, yes. the industrialization yes. policies. Oh, yes, okay. on the automotive industry specifically. All so right. the, the, you, you can't uh, create a local content requirement under the WTO rules. And the second thing you can't do is you can't subsidize exports over domestic supply because then you create a distortion in a third uh, or a second economy or a third mm -hmm. economy. Um, the consequence of that is that we had to find a way of making the APDP WTO compliant. So therefore you incentivize production wow. and you become agnostic of the market that that production goes into. Mm. <clears throat> so the APDP was launched and the APDP essentially converted the export subsidies into these production subsidies, and we anticipated that there would be an increase of volume of production and there would be an increase of local content because the distortions on the export side were removed. The reality is we increased the volume of production. We made more vehicles, but we didn't increase local content. As a matter of fact, local content kept going down in our vehicles. Oh, really? We increased local content in its quantum. 
but our local content dropped from 44% to 38% in our vehicles. Okay. And local content was 60% in our vehicles back at the turn of the phase six program into the MRDP. Wow. So we've seen a major deterioration in the value of South African content in our vehicles. So the rationalization of multiple products to you know, higher volume of a single yes. product resulted in less local content. Yes, which is the exact opposite of the laws of economics. Yeah, that's surprising. That's right. And the reason for that was things like catalytic converters. Why invest heavily in a An set of complex assembly, technology yeah. for vehicle assembly when you can grow your CAT exports to 50 billion rand, of which 42 billion of the 50 billion is platinum you were going to export anyway. anyway. <laughs> and uh, you earn major uh, incentives that. on those. Uh, and therefore, you limit your levels of, of uh, embedded content. There's always a loophole, right? There's always a loophole. So, so, so talk, <laughs> talking about investment, Justin, um, and looking at all the opportunities that we have in Industry 4.0, would you, would you say that as a country we need to invest more in digitizing or in industrializing? I don't think the two are... I, I wouldn't separate them. I would say you need to invest heavily in digitization in order to more effectively industrialize. And I must say, even this morning, I had the pleasure of going through the plant with Yanesh and, and, and Quinton. And, you know, the bedrock of your organization lies in actually your marriage of both the physical and the, and the digital. If you don't master the physical components of the connecting point to the digital, you don't really have a value proposition. The value package that is created through the digitizing of processes and then the creation of the digitalization packages of value that you create, whether it be through the maintenance or the upskilling or, or the, the empowerment of individuals who are operating on those production lines, it still requires you to master the physical processes because there's still always a piece of physical equipment that has got either a small or a very substantial role to play in the overall value package. Mm. So I would argue that the challenge of policy development in South Africa has and remains focused on how do we build industrial capability. Now, the automotive industry has been the star performer in South Africa. So as we've gone through the different policies and through into the APDP phase, which we're still in, and we talk now about the master plan phase from 2021, but the master plan is actually the first time that the country has not just developed policy, it's actually created a future vision and created a essentially a broad strategy framework of intended activities to support the realization of those long-term objectives. They're not policy. So the master plan has got six pillars and then two foundational elements. The APDP is just one of the two foundational elements. And then there's okay. the six pillars. How do we develop our local market? How do we develop the regional market? How do we uh, build world-class infrastructure to support the industry? How do we deepen localization? How do we uh, drive transformation within the value chain? And how do we build skills and associated technology. I should put it the other way around. How do we build technology and associated skills? Um, and those are the elements of the master plan. We, we, we're in a very awkward position in relation to our geographical location. And sometimes just think this is your biggest weakness. The biggest weakness is we're so far away from everything. And when I say that, that sounds really disparaging because we're not far away from a lot of things. We're next door to Zimbabwe, we're next door to all of our neighboring states. The problem is they don't consume vehicles in any great quantity. Mm. And so from a what we call a viable automotive space, South Africa is really vulnerable because we're not contiguous to any major markets. We're not contiguous to any major uh, um, opportunities in the short term which means that our industry has to be supported in a way that allows it to export into distant markets as well as for supply into, into the domestic markets. But while we're doing that, we've got to try and build a regional market dynamic. We've got to try and actually ensure that the local environment's health improves. And at the moment, that's our big challenge. Our big challenge is the domestic market's in trouble. And it's not because of COVID. It was in trouble before COVID. And the regional market is showing very little sign of... Um, of uh, uh, increasing in a substantial way its demand for vehicles. Sure. So we've got these logistics disadvantages, which we need to deal with, but ultimately we're in the right neighborhood because all of the data shows that over the course of the next 20 years, the most likely growth driver of the global economy is sub-Saharan Africa. So the short-term issues are, are, are hurting us, but the long-term opportunities are very substantial. The question is, do we as South Africa benefit from those 
uh, opportunities, or are we just going to uh, continue trading imported products into our into our domestic market and watch somebody else take the the opportunity? Absolutely, and create the value because yeah. the, the real value doesn't lie in money. The real value of economic activity is that high level economic activity builds people. South Africa doesn't have a money problem. South Africa is a people problem. We don't have enough skills. We don't have enough people in gainful employment. We don't have enough people living productive lives. How do we create that? And the way you do that is to build industrial capability. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm a, from, an, from an economics perspective, I'm quite a liberal. I believe in free trade is a good thing. The laws of economics highlight that very clearly. But we have to recognize that you know, trade deals, much like technology, are um, they, they need to be framed by societal needs. Ultimately, all decisions need to be made on the basis of what's good for the most of the people. And I would argue in a South African context, the most critical thing we need to do is get people into jobs. Hmm. And you can't put people into service jobs because service jobs are the beneficiaries of productive jobs. It's a spillover effect from the productive jobs. And our productive jobs have declined, as I've said, by one and a half million um, in the manufacturing space alone over the last uh, 30 years, which is hugely problematic. That's crazy. So, so here's a, a theoretical question. So given your experience from TWIMS, and obviously you're, you're fortunate to be exposed to a lot of leaders um, in manufacturing, in South Africa specifically, what, what are the, the, the key things that manufacturing leaders from around the world um, should consider um, if they wanted to set up shop in South Africa? Because, I mean, it's all going to come down to foreign direct investment um, or some sort of investment from uh, the outside world to set up shop in South Africa. <laughs> Yanis, that's the hardest question. I live in Durban in KwaZulu-Natal. Yeah, well. uh, given what I've been through over the last two months, uh, I'm not the right person to speak to about foreign direct investment. You know, I would not advise anybody to invest in KwaZulu-Natal. And, and not because I'm not uh, a... Uh, a loyal citizen, but because that would be um, something that I think would be uh, uh, highly inappropriate to do for the investor. It's not a safe place to invest. So first of all, we've, we've got to deal with the basics. And I'm not going to talk about those basics. Yeah. There's other people that are much uh, better uh, trained and have much more expertise in that particular area. But we have a major problem. I don't think foreign direct investment is getting us out of anything. Okay. I think domestic investment is the is the future. And all the, all the evidence of foreign... Remember, foreign direct investment never happens without domestic investment happening first. Yep. There's no evidence of that in economic history. Yep. Multinationals follow the success of domestic capital. And all investors are essentially one of three things, right? You're either seeking a market, you're seeking an asset, or you're seeking a resource. We've got our resources. So those resources are not going to go away. We will get foreign direct investment in our mining industry and in agriculture. But in something that is tradable, like um, manufacturing. I don't see any foreign direct investment coming into South Africa in any material way until we've stabilized the place politically. Beyond that, where are the opportunities? I think there are major opportunities because our market's going to grow. And if we think of our market as a regional market or um, as an as a even broader continental market, then obviously there's major, major opportunities. The challenge is how do we build up our assets? Because... If, if the market opportunity is there, but, but our neighbors end up providing better assets than what we provide, well, then foreign yeah. direct investors will go there. Yeah. Or we will go there. Or we will. That's a problem, mm -hmm. right? That's a, and that's what's happening already. Yeah. Now, we've got domestic investors that are no longer looking at South Africa and looking rather to invest elsewhere. So we've got to get those, those, fundamentals, those fundamentals right. Earlier, we had, you know, you, you were highlighting um, the, the opportunities in technology in an African space. And I think your summary is how do we use technology while creating jobs? I mean, that, that's 100% that's correct. Because South Africa is in a, in a, or the region rather, because Africa's population growth rate is actually not that, it's, it's not uh, that dramatic. It's yeah. really north of us that we've got major population growth. That's either a dividend, because of course, yeah. you've got more, more people that are going to demand things. Or it's a curse because if you can't provide them with jobs, uh, they're going to create social instability that is not going to support, that is that is not going to be conducive towards either consumption or production. Yep. So I think we face um, a real challenge and one that we need to effectively deal with, which is how do we deal with the asset issues 
So how do we make South Africa into a, a, a more productive space? And that deals with basic infrastructure on the ground. We need to have good policies. I think in the auto industry, we have a superb policy. Okay. You know, and you know, people say, well, because you're involved and they've got a point, I may be being defensive, but I do think it's a good policy. Well, it's worked. It's proved that it's, over it's the last right. couple of years. And it's, and it's proven because it's done so well relative to all the other manufacturing sectors yeah, that exactly. don't have an equivalent program. Yep. But if you would ask me, my, in, the, in my, the pit of my stomach, I do feel disappointed. I think our auto industry could be substantially bigger. Yeah. We, we should easily be producing over a million vehicles a year, given the size of our, of our market. So I don't think our automotive industry's potential has been even closely fully realized. I think there's much greater potential than uh, what we are, are presently achieving, not because of the policy, yeah. but because of all the other issues the that we... The political side that you mentioned yes, earlier. That, mm. that, and it's not just political. You know, we've got manufacturing requires three levels of policy to align effectively. At the top level, you need to have a good policy. So let's agree that the APDP is a good policy. Great. Second level is what we call the meso level. The meso level is the infrastructure that exists in a society to make things happen. Broadband technology and the price of data. Bulk infrastructure, whether it be a port or a road or a rail. And then we start wavering immediately. Yeah. You know, there's big issues there. Yeah. Uh, very expensive, not particularly uh, reliable, um, not particularly safe. I mean, lots of loss of, of, uh, of cargo, etc. Then you've got your micro level. <clears throat> Now, the problem is the micro level is the overlooked level of industrial policy. Work is not sexy. It's, do you have electricity every day? Yeah. Is your solid waste removed every day? Is your, uh, all of your contaminants that you produce in your manufacturing environment, is it safely removed in, the, in that environment um, every day? Is your industrial estate safe? Or do you have to have armed guards there all of the time to keep it safe? Yeah. You know, it all comes at a cost. Yeah. Um, and so is water available? Yeah. I mean, thinking of, of Port Elizabeth's crisis at the moment. You've got all of these issues that we take for granted like breathing air. Yeah. If they're there, we ignore them and we just expect them to happen and we expect them to be reasonably cheap and we expect them to um, uh, uh, essentially operate in the background so we can add the value that we need to add value in the businesses. Yeah. When you start having to put lots of time and energy into those things, because that now starts failing at a, uh, at a ground level, you can have the best policy at the top. It's not going to work. But it's like struggling for air. Yep. You know, yeah. That becomes really important. You focus everything on trying to breathe properly. Yeah. So that for me is one of the big issues that we're dealing with. You know? And uh, once again, being based in KwaZulu-Natal and working with firms, you've got factories in Isatebe that have either been burnt out or the infrastructure around them has been destroyed by the mob. Um, yeah, you can offer them the best policies in the world. You can offer them whatever you want. Yeah. The, the micro foundations of competitiveness have been undermined. Yeah. And why don't firms invest in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo? And I'm not picking on them. So please, if anybody see, uh, uh, listens to this or sees this and says, well, you're having a go at the DRC. The DRC's per capita output of, or gross value added um, of manufacturing is $1 per person. Ours is about 550. Okay, so they're one 550th our level of productive output. The USA's is five and a half thousand. Wow. Okay, so we one tenth of the USA's. Um, why would somebody not invest in the DRC? The DRC could offer them APDP plus 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 plus. It makes no difference. They could offer them the most amazing container. Uh, discount rates, both A and C, and no one would invest it there. Why? Because the micro foundations don't exist to be able to run a productive yeah. uh, facility. We've got to be very careful in South Africa. It can't just be the national policy. You've got to sort out local government. You've got to make sure that the infrastructure at the base level is stable. And um, especially as we go into this digital age, what is the digital infrastructure that is going to be required? Yeah. If um, we think of your technologies that you've developed, both in the physical and in, and in the digital space, the value that will be created through the combinatorial value of those two technologies requires the physical infrastructure and the digital infrastructure to be stable, to be cheap, and to be scalable yep. for the future. And you know, those are some of the concerns I have around whether we have that type of required infrastructure in a South African context. That doesn't mean I'm negative because these things aren't binary. Things are either getting worse or they're getting better. <laughs> Yeah. We can always turn things around and make them better. The concern I have is that things are not getting better. Things are getting worse. Yeah. So I'd be happy if wherever we are is wherever we are, but we were getting better. 
the danger is that we, we, we don't deal with the real issues on the ground and they get worse. So on that uh, controversial note, <laughs> speaking of this um, uh, sort of micro uh, infrastructure that's required, electricity, we've obviously got a new policy or a proposal related to EVs, alternative yes. energy vehicles. Yes. Um, I'm 50-50 on that. Um, purely because of our, 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 the way our electricity is uh, manu well, uh, created in South Africa, mm -hmm. uh, plus the, uh, the raw materials that go into batteries, lithium, the mining of lithium, the, uh, the mining of rare earth magnets that go into the, the motors that go into vehicles. I'd love to get your take on, yeah. on, on EVs, maybe from a South African context and then from a global context. Is this the, the green solution that yeah. we all uh, are waiting for? Okay, so maybe I start with international. We have no choice. Manufacturing has to decarbonize. Manufacturing has to become carbon neutral, um, both in the production cycle and in the in-use cycle of the product itself. The automotive industry is one of the biggest contributors to carbon emissions globally, uh, both in its production form and in its product use form. So I don't think there's any choice. I think we have to green the automotive industry. Your question, though, is around battery electric vehicles, yep. which is an interesting one. I don't understand the technology sufficiently. I've had the benefit of visiting some of the institutes globally to try and understand them. Admittedly, a lot of it went over my head. But the technology that has impressed me the most globally is what I saw in Japan with the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Yep. So I had the benefit of seeing the Toyota Mirai and understanding how that technology works. I think it's just amazing. Um, yep. The byproduct is water. The byproduct is water. So I think that ultimately, I personally think in the long run, hydrogen wins. Green hydrogen wins. I can't yep. be careful about brown hydrogen or blue hydrogen. But green hydrogen ultimately wins. The problem is the time frame and the window of opportunity that we have before the climate crisis that we are facing, and we're already in it. I mean, it's not facing it. We're already in the climate crisis. That technology, unfortunately, doesn't compete well um, against the internal combustion engine. The battery electric vehicle appears to have a shorter term advantage. It's going to catch up. It looks very soon uh, with us probably in the next four to five years on a price parity basis, if you take total cost of ownership models into account. The problem we have in South Africa is twofold. Right? First one is people don't have money. Our middle class is much poorer than the middle class in, say, Europe or North America, which means that there's a high level of sensitivity to price movements in vehicles. And so we can't afford expensive battery electric vehicles. And they're at the moment, still more expensive. Now, you can argue, yes, but they'll be cheaper over the seven-year lifespan because uh, if you take a TCEO model into account, well, you know, you'll get your money back with a reduced energy costs. Well, there's a big problem with that. Right? You can't afford the initial price point. You can't afford the initial price point. Therefore, it needs to be subsidized. Well, the government's got no money, so no one's subsidizing it. But the second problem we have in South Africa, which is the real elephant in the room, is uh, Eskom. You know, most of our energy comes from coal, and it's dirty coal for that. Mm. I mean, we're one of the most polluting economies in the whole world. As a matter of fact, in Pumalanga province, in certain areas around Witbank, um, I mean, those areas have some of the highest levels of air pollution globally. Wow. Um, and the, the battery electric vehicle value proposition is an ecosystem one. It's actually not about the vehicle. It's where does the energy come from? And um, if the energy supply is coal, well, you're much better driving a small internal combustion engine um, because the thermal conversion properties on coal are very similar to fuel. Um, and the thermal con if, and, and if you're running an old <laughs> uh, 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 coal-fired uh, furnace for your energy source, well, you know, you're much, much better off driving a small displacement us. Um, so... There's a real conundrum that we face in this African environment. The challenge is if we choose to do nothing or if we choose to delay the transition to green, we've got a major problem in the industry because um, we export 65% of what we produce. As a matter of fact, the single biggest market for the South African automotive industry is not South Africa. The single biggest market for the South African automotive industry is the European um, Mon mm. Not monetary area, the European, 
I would have said the European Union until the UK left. <laughs> it's the UK plus the EU combined, whatever you call that, the economic area of Europe, whatever the new title will be. But if you take that as one market, that is actually our biggest market now. Mm -hmm. uh, substantially more than South Africa, we supplied more. We supplied 100,000 more vehicles into the EU market in 2019 than we did into our own market. Yeah. And that's changing rapidly. And that market has banned the internal combustion engine at some point into the future, depending on which country, 2040, 2035, 2030 or 2025. If you don't have a vehicle industry, then you ban it earlier, right? Because there's no consequence to it. Yeah. If you do have an industry, but it's marginal, well, then you ban it in 2030. If you do have a big industry and you're wanting to keep the industry but force it to change to green uh, technologies, well, then you ban it either in 2035 or you ban it in, in 2040. So we're going to see this major shift in the European Union. And there's a problem because that means we have to shift. Yeah, that's our because customer. There's, because of the complementation model of our policy. Yeah. Our complementation model says you provide one vehicle into the local market and you supply two vehicles externally. And then you can import the two vehicles you need in the domestic yep. market duty free because you've exported the two the two vehicles. That's great. But what happens if those two vehicles are now battery uh, electric vehicles and the domestic market doesn't have battery electric? How do you get the complementation? Yep. And that's the conundrum that we're presently facing. So we need to step into the future. We need to drive new energy vehicles. South Africa has its own unique set of conditions. I would think that the initial phase is to go soft hybrid, so uh, non-plug-in hybrids, then plug-in hybrids, especially on um, our love for light commercial vehicles and ladder chassis product, and then uh, we will ultimately go uh, battery electric on a broader scale. There'll be battery electric, um, I think, quite soon in uh, sort of highly developed urban areas, Santon, um, the sort of... Uh, Cape Waterfront area and um, and some other similar places like Mshlonga. But but by and large, I think we're going to see hybridization as the key driver for a long period, for quite a long period of, of time. Okay. And, and so, Justin, how do SMEs get involved in future manufacturing technologies? It's a great question. You know, if I think about it, I mean, the automotive industry makes things difficult because it's a multinationally driven industry and the license to operate is high. I mean, you'll know that from supplying into the automotive industry. You, know, you get a list of standards that you have to adhere to, otherwise you're locked out. That's quite difficult for SMEs. However, SMEs can always participate at a lower tier of activity because you know, your suppliers don't necessarily have the same pressures. And so therefore, um, I think enterprise development's a big opportunity in an industry like the automotive industry to develop, to develop uh, SMEs. But, you know, the challenge with digital is both its opportunity. It's difficult to get into the digital space because it's an entirely new set of economic activity. But you know, the nice thing about digital is that once you've created a digital package, you, know, you can scale it up instantly. And so you can go from one to a million. Uh, and it's essentially done instantaneously. So it's, it's, it's completely scalable once you've got the, the required digital package. You can do it freely because this is really the cost of data and data is becoming cheaper and cheaper and you can do it perfectly because there's no fidelity lost in the digital package as you as you create duplicates the power of copy and paste it's a, absolutely so smes get that benefit you know and so you know people would say well how would you get locked out you do get locked out if the platform's already created and you can't get in but you know the airbnbs and the ubers and the lifts of the world and didi chushing that they were all smes ones how did they scale up so rapidly? Well, they're able to scale up so rapidly because the digital models that they operate within allows that to happen. Why do physical firms scale up so slowly? Working capital considerations, finding managers to actually run duplicates of the physical infrastructure. It's a long, laborious process of, of uh, developing those skills whilst you keep your hard-earned returns uh, as retained income to try and fund that growth. So the digital model I think in many ways provides an exciting opportunity for SM, SMEs. The challenge with SMEs is the intellectual property that vests, because ultimately digital is cool, but it's not necessarily value adding. I think a digital becomes value adding when it connects to a cyber physical platform of, or it's part of a cyber physical platform that creates value. How do you create that value without understanding the market, without building the intellectual property in your own business to understand the value wedge that you can create within that value chain, which ultimately still has a, always has a physical component to it. 
and that's the that I would argue is the challenge for us in 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 South Africa is how do we make sure we've got the I would argue you're going to struggle to build a serious digital capability in South Africa if we don't take STEM seriously because ultimately digital is not a creative process. I, it's a creative process married to a science technology um, uh, base. Yeah. I really enjoyed your, your talk um, and the title of it is Demystifying 4IR. And I just wanted to ask you, why is there a general misconception around 4IR and, and the fear that it will, it will take jobs away from the general population? So let's look back at economic history. I mean, when the first industrial revolution happened and um, the uh, weaving mills in the United Kingdom were using steam, were able to massively improve efficiencies uh, and people lost their jobs. Um, and we had the Luddites. The Luddites were people led by a person called Ludd, which well, if you followed him, you become a Luddite. <laughs> and he went around uh, with literally with... Uh, with axes and, and hammers, and they went and smashed these new machines. <laughs> and so they, ever since then, we use the term a Luddite. A Luddite means somebody who doesn't like technology. I made the point earlier, we're all smart looking backwards. We're, very, we're not so good at looking, looking forward. So if you asked me, what are the new jobs of tomorrow? I can't tell you. Because if you'd asked me that question 20 years ago, I would have gotten it horribly wrong. I wouldn't have ever seen you know, the potential of an Odin platform and the value it can create on top of the, of, of, of the production line. And yet it creates massive value and potentially creates huge employment opportunities. But you don't see it going forward. But when you look at a new technology, it's very easy to take that value pack, the, the technology package and look backwards and go, it's going to destroy those jobs because those are the things I understand. So when I talk about demystifying Industry 4.0, we have to accept that the history of innovation is that innovation always creates jobs. Why? Because innovation ultimately requires a social compact. This notion that somehow Industry 4.0 is a future of AR in the form of the singularity coming together, bringing all of the consciousness of, of, of people and intelligence together and then telling us what to do is great for science fiction movies. But it's not reality because any form of technology use in a society requires a social compact because it's a, it's a, it's a socially constructed element. Technology doesn't exist by itself. Yeah. And so I believe that innovation going forward, because it's a social construct, will be used to better society because the decisions that we made around regulations and laws and all the rest of it We'll be focused with that objective in mind. No one governs a country with the intention of destroying the place. One always governs with the intention of developing the place. So you might make mistakes and there might be some, some, some destruction in certain segments that people didn't see. But I think ultimately the history of innovation is one of improving the lives of people. And where it doesn't do that, there is a negative kickback, a, a negative response cycle. Yep. Loop. So and history has proved that, and history has proven with, with that. The tractor, uh, the PLC. Yeah, that's that's why you know I go back to it, and, and and anybody who studies this, you know, always argues with good historical evidence, and will you know, go back to some of the smartest minds, people who we would recognize as being brilliant, who made a fortune and contributed numerous patents, warning about the future of of of, of incoming technology and being horribly wrong every single time. Yeah. So. I'm not a technology positivist in the sense of it will, but so I'm neutral on technology. I just think as society develops, society will ensure that the technologies are used appropriately because ultimately the world has to operate to do the best for the most people. Yep. And I don't see how technology can somehow operate autonomously of that driver in a society. Yeah, yeah I'm a real firm believer that uh, for our um, has its biggest application in Africa. Um, it's because we have the most people. Yes. It's as, it's as simple as that yeah. in my mind. Yeah. Just to, to kind of change gears a little bit um, and to talk about the business models that are changing. Uh, we talk about Airbnb versus yeah. Hilton uh, as an example. Uh, there's these notions of transport as a service. Uh, yes. We talk about Zooks uh, creating autonomous taxis without drivers. So these business <laughs> models are completely changing. Um, what advice would you give people in that space? That's a great question. Um, my advice would be twofold. 
First one would be to embrace experimentation. The problem with technology is that it remains alien until you understand it. So you have to understand it. Given where that individual technology element is, and the problem with Industry 4.0 is that it's a basket of so many different technologies. Mm. Some of them are quite mature. Some of them are highly immature. Some of them have got great futures based on associated technology. So it's spillovers, the, the, the ubiquity of data, for example, yep. you know, makes AI so much more powerful. So we've got this basket of technologies that are coming at us. My line would be experiment. Experiment across your 4P framework. I love this 4P framework because all businesses are either going to have to change, well, they're going to have to change, but the question is how much they change. Their products, their processes, the position within the value chain or in, in relation to the market or the paradigm. Paradigm's a scary one. Mm. It's when um, we no longer think of a market in the same way. You know, all the clothing I'm wearing, I bought at a, at a retailer. What happens if I, when I can 3D print that clothing and code is now... The, the fashion is now the fashion you know it's it's me transferring that code now it's far away but that changes everything mm. you know and then what happens to the tfgs and the woolworths and the mr p's of the world you know, they've got seriously successful businesses in a particular way now they'll extend their businesses into the digital space you know? very soon we're all going to be having vr headsets and we'll go into an mrp uh, emporium and we'll experience all the wonderful clothing they've got to offer that for me is a radically changed business model but it's not a paradigm change yep the paradigm change comes when the code is, the, in essence, the, the basis of the fashion. So every value chain, every type of economic activity is going to be fundamentally changed at different points in different ways. And the only way one can be fit for those, it's like, for me, it's, it's going to run every day, 5Ks, just keep yourself fit. How do, you, how do you work out what level of fitness you need to be at yeah. in relation to these technologies, but without being silly, because you can also throw lots of money at emergent tech that actually doesn't have the headroom you think it's got. Yeah. So my argument would be to experiment. Second one is I believe that the leadership of organizations have to humble themselves in relation to this technology. The biggest problem we all have, and I'm getting older now, so I'm in the same position as, as most uh, people holding senior positions, is we are the victims of our own success, right? So I see the world through a set of tools and skill sets that I've acquired over many, many years that makes me really good at the things that mattered before. It doesn't always make me that competent at understanding the things that are coming towards me. But because you're now the top of the food chain, because you're the one deciding on how investment's going to be made and where money's going to be allocated, you tend to hold those things quite closely. Question is, how do you bring in the youth? And when I mean youth, I don't mean some kid off out of a trick. I'm talking about that new master's graduate. He's now got the, uh, a mechatronics qualification. They don't, they're not encumbered by your uh, bag of tricks. They don't yet have your experience, which is incredibly invaluable in things you do now, but can actually be quite limiting for the things you need to do because you're looking at it through your lens. How do you create space for those people in an organization? And I, so I think it's about how do you create the space then to bring in those young professionals who are much more digitally capable and much more digitally comfortable. And, 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 uh, uh, and it's not so much about the technology. It's about not being locked into that business space, yeah. the, the, the mindset, mindset. that's defined our success. Mm. Your, your previous paradigm. Yes. Your, yeah, the one that's gotten, to you, gotten yeah. you to where you it are. It worked, right? Pardon? It worked. So yes. that's the mindset. So Absolutely. it should work again. But and, it's, and it's quite lazy sometimes because yeah. you go, well, you know, I'm already wealthy if, you run, if you're running a big business and you're going, well, maybe just squeeze a thing for three or four more years. Mm -hmm. That's what kills most businesses. Yeah. Because actually there's a certain point where you can't just squeeze what you've got. You've got to go and create these new value packages. That's why for me, it's around the experimentation on the one side and it's about the, um, the bringing in of a new set of skills to challenge the higher order skills that have already framed that business as success. Yeah. And that's quite a difficult thing for senior managers to get their head around. What I find often happens is you create a little R&D lab, you bring in some smart people. And ignore what they do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But you then, but also you, you then want them to prove things on the same return on capital yeah. employed calculation. You've got the same set yeah. of metrics that have defined your success to date. Whereas actually that may no longer be appropriate. Yeah. The irony of it is that's why I asked Goodall to join. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I'm 20 years older than him. <laughs> Um, my, my last question for you, Justin, would be, what is the legacy that you want to leave in the tech space? You know, through TWIMS, and it's, 
I, I, it's not about me. I'd like to leave a legacy of twins having an impact in the tech space. Because for me, institutionally, we need to create a space for people to be comfortable with technology. None of us wants to appear to be stupid. I'm fortunate. I have a PhD. I'm happy to be proven stupid. I'm happy to go somewhere and realize I don't know what the hell I'm doing because I'm confident in my abilities. The problem with technology is that because it's alien and it's emerging and it's coming through very, very quickly, many managers are averse towards it for one reason only. They don't want to look silly. They don't want to look caught out. And through TWIMS, what we're trying to do is we're trying to ensure that there's a serious academic engagement with these technology disruptors because we need to understand them technically. But we also need to bring them into the strategy space and to make them, to bring them into the strategy space, we've got to make the managers who are responsible for strategy and businesses to feel comfortable with them and to recognize that actually in this technology space, you're probably going to fail nine out of 10 times. And actually that failure is not a problem as long as that one success story, you know, propels the, the business forward. And as you get better in the tech space, you won't make nine mistakes, one uh, success. It'll be eight to two. And then eventually you'll be scoring more goals and you'll be conceding them. How do we get that? The biggest danger we have in a South African environment is mindset. South African mindsets are very conservative, tied often to the politics of the country. Firms want short returns on investment. Firms want high returns on investment because they don't know what the future holds. And the problem is technology is an uncertain element that we need to understand and we need to have confidence in the long-term future to play with the technology. So you're actually asking for leaders in manufacturing to be incredibly bold and brave, to play with the technology, spend vast amounts of money over a period of time experimenting with that technology when they're not sure whether the operating environment that they're located in is going to be conducive to their businesses in the long term. And that's a scary proposition for, for those people. So what is the legacy question? The legacy question for me is how do we demystify Industry 4.0? How does an institution like TWIMS ensure that managers feel comfortable experimenting, playing with, asking questions that they should have asked 10 years ago, but they thought they would be seen to not know what they're doing if they ask the question. Ask the question, work it out. Um, it's very clear to me that all businesses have to be digitally enabled. All businesses are going to ultimately be digitally transformed. The key question is whether they're going to shift in the future towards digitally dominated businesses because that's where the value lies relative to the physical thing that they're doing, or whether they are going to have a, um, uh, the majority of the value still being created in the physical product. And I think it varies from one type of firm to the next, but every firm and the management in those firms have to travel that journey of, of discovery. TWIMS wants to support firms in that discovery process because it will speed up the learning journey and reduce the cost of learning. No one wants to pay, uh, incredibly high school fees. Everybody's happy to pay school fees, but you want to try and reduce those school fees as much as you can. Justin, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Really, really. Uh, fascinating conversation. I've learned a whole lot out of this and I agree with almost everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Really